MDs and osteopaths in the United States and England, um, up to thousands of physicians were using them uh, in the early 1900s, 1910, 1920. Um, the Flexner Report came out in which it was said that um, medicine needed to be standardized and anybody that used electromagnetic therapies, herbs, nutrition, homeopathy, or electromagnetic therapies would lose their license to practice, which at that time was granted by the AMA. So um, they finally got serious about it and turned it into like a rule that everybody paid attention to. By 1934, it took them a number of years to make it into something with teeth. Um, so the machines went in the back room uh, in the 1920s, and they went on the junk heap, and when Grandpa died, they went into the trash, and they went into museums, and they went into the basement, and they just went away. Harry Van Gilder um, was an osteopath and naturopath from um, England who bought a practice in 1946 that came with a machine um, um, and a list of frequencies that were created in 1922. Um, he walked into the back room of this clinic, and there was this machine with a seat over it. And he took the seat off and said, hmm, I wonder what that is, and found a list of frequencies that came with that device. I have never seen the original machine. Um, I've actually never seen the original list. <clears throat> George Douglas gave me um, that list in 1995. Um, was actually a list that he made from what he found in Harry's practice when he went to work with Harry for three months back in 19, the 1980s. Came home with the frequencies typed on pieces of binder paper and put them in a drawer. 1995, so 12, 13 years later, he pulled the list out and we had a two-channel microcurrent machine and wondered if those frequencies would work on the microcurrent machine the same way they did on Harry's machine. So we started using them in 1995 on my chronically ill patients, found out that they worked, um, and um, started using them on myofascial pain patients in 1996. The results were so amazing that we had to, I started teaching it in 1997 to find out if the results were reproducible. And it turned out in 1997 that they were reproducible. Since then, we have taught any place from four to um, 12 classes in frequency-specific microcurrent <clears throat> every year since 1997. So there are two or 3,000 practitioners around the world. Um, truth to be told, I have no idea how the frequencies were derived, how they came up with them. And we're really uncertain about the mechanisms of action, although we have some ideas now based on genetics and our clinical outcomes about what the mechanism could be. And you'll hear more about that in a little bit. Um, the 1920s equipment was not microcurrent. It was DC, direct current, plugged into the wall back when wall current was direct current. So what do the frequencies do and how are they used? Well, we started out talking about old problems in medicine. So the old problems in medicine and healthcare are how do you heal injuries? What do you do after surgery? What do you do to help heal wounds? Well, there are some limitations to humans trying to heal these kind of injuries, surgery, and uh, post-operative stuff, and wounds. ATP production. ATP is what your body uses for energy. It's a chemical, um, it's a chemical molecule that gets turned into energy by the cells in your body. And that has certain limits to how much energy can be produced. <clears throat> how much new blood supply can you manufacture to heal injuries, um, post-operative injuries and wounds? How much blood supply? How much collagen? How, elast how much elastin? How stretchy will the frequencies, will the tissue be? So the first question that microcurrent answers is what would happen to healing if you could increase energy production in the cells by 500 percent? Well, there are three different studies showing that microcurrent increases ATP production or energy production by 500 percent in rat skin and in human cells. 
um, up to 500 microamps increases ATP production or energy production by 500%. That's more energy than you could possibly need um, to increase the rate of healing. That kind of increase in energy <coughs> increases protein synthesis, amino acid transport, um, protein synthesis by 70%, amino acid transport by 40%. That increased cyclic AMP, which is a downstream metabolized metabolite of an ATP production in human lymphocytes. So we know this same thing works, the same process works in humans as it does in rat skin and cultures. And then um, Seegers in 2001 and 2002 found out that just current, this is not frequency modulated, it's just DC current, <coughs> um, activates signal transduction mechanisms in um, human lymphocytes. So those two papers are work, worth looking up if that's something you're interested in. So microcurrent as a modality is improved by the FDA in the United States in the class of TENS devices, even though it's not a TENS. TENS um, has about a thousand times higher current level than microcurrent. So this is millions of an ampere, not thousands. Um, it's approved for aesthetic use that's not prescription, but for pain management or anything else, it's approved as a prescription device as if it was a TENS device, even though it's not a TENS. It's billed by physical therapists, MDs, chiropractors, acupuncturists, naturopaths, occupational therapists, as if it was a TENS. Microcurrent devices generally on the market vary very widely. Um, they'll have DC direct current or pulse direct current. They have different waveforms, square waves, sine waves, ramped square waves, <clears throat> tsunami waves, H waves. Um, they'll have one channel or two channels. There are some units that are combined, microcurrent with ultrasound, interferential, galvanic, and microcurrent. Um, and for most of those devices, the frequency is generally not important. They either have a limited number, 3 tenths, 6 tenths, 9 tenths, one, uh, 100 hertz, uh, 300 hertz, that they sort of seem to pick randomly. Um, or there's a sweep of frequencies. There's one device that does a sweep from 0 to 1,000 and back again. And, um, but it doesn't use or recommend any particular single frequency. So those are the devices. And then we had animal studies done at University of Washington. It's unpublished because they were, the study was done for estheticians who use microcurrent for skin care. And they really don't care about peer-reviewed papers. So this data is unpublished. They biopsied bunny. Um, they did 20 days of microcurrent, an hour a day, five days a week for four weeks. And then they biopsied bunny again. And what they found was the vascularity increased by 39%. So the blood supply to the skin of the rabbit increased by 39%. Collagen increased by 14%. That's these little black stripes in here. And then the elastin, these black lines, increased by 48%. Elastin is extraordinary. Elastin is what makes your tissue elastic, stretchy, flexible just like it sounds. So when you're healing wounds, one of the power injuries, one of the problems with wound healing and injury repair is that the repair tissue is not stretchy. It is <clears throat> um, stiff and uh, tends to be re-injured right adjacent to the part that was injured before. The fact that when you use microcurrent to repair tissue, you get an increase in elastin means that injury healing done with um, the application of microcurrent creates tissue, repair tissue that is elastic, stronger because of the increase in collagen, and healthier because of the increase in blood supply. So you have to ask yourself, what would happen to injury and wound healing outcomes if you could increase ATP by 500%, vascularity, blood supply, collagen, and elastin. So what we found out in practice is microcurrent. So these effects are achieved just by unmodulated microcurrent. What we found out clinically is that 
the frequency effect does make a huge difference in healing. Unmodulated microcurrent increases ATP production, but the frequencies add an additional dimension to healing and tissue repair that makes a huge difference. Delayed onset muscle soreness is what happens when you work out and you do unfamiliar eccentric contractions like hamstring curls is what they did with this particular study, but it can be biceps, it can be any muscle. It is anything that exercises a muscle to the point where it's going to be sore the next day. This was a controlled trial done in Ireland by Denise Curtis and her colleagues, um, and it compared frequency-specific microcurrent to a 1999 study that showed that microcurrent, single-channel, single-frequency, 3 tenths of a hertz and 30 hertz, had no effect on delayed onset muscle soreness. So we knew that plain, unmodulated microcurrent had no effect on um, delayed onset muscle soreness. They wanted to find out if adding frequencies to the microcurrent would make a difference. And the frequencies they used are ones that we use for stopping bleeding, 18 hertz on channel A and 60 hertz, 62 hertz for the blood supply on channel B. It's pathology on channel A and a tissue on channel B, torn and broken. In the blood supply, the fascia and the tendon reducing inflammation in general and reducing inflammation in the muscle belly, the fascia, and the tendon. Those are the frequencies that were used. And what they found was the addition of frequencies to microcurrent made a huge difference. So at 24 hours, the pain with the late onset muscle soreness starts, pain and stiffness. <clears throat> the sham treated leg, the pain was a 5. The treated leg, the pain was a 1. 48 hours later, when the pain is worse, at its worst, <clears throat> the SAM leg or the leg treated by the placebo microcurrent was a 7 on a 0 to 10 scale. Um, the treated leg was a 1.2. And uh, at 72 hours, the SAM leg was a 4, and the treated leg was less than a 1. It was 0.7. P-value is a measure of statistical significance, and the P-value of point 0005 says that there's less than five chances in 100,000 that this would be a uh, coincidence. So it is a huge advance in the treatment of delayed onset muscle soreness in both athletes and um, um, bodybuilders, weightlifters, and the, the um, um, casual exercise or patient who would normally be really sore after a workout. And it also demonstrates that the frequencies make a huge difference in injury recovery. And the important part for athletes <coughs> and exercisers is that there is no other effective treatment, either prevention before the fact or after the fact, that will prevent or treat delayed onset muscle soreness. So this is a huge um, advancement in um, treatment of athletic injuries, which is probably why um, there are six or eight, what is that, eight NFL teams that are using frequency-specific microcurrent to treat their football players. It's also being used in the, um, the National Soccer League and the Canadian Soccer League. We have a couple of basketball teams and one or two baseball teams. So it's becoming more widely known in professional athletics, and there are a number of um, Olympic athletes who have their own personal units and trainers who use FSM on them. <coughs> um, Post-operative outcomes uh, improve using FSM after C-section. This was, study was done by John Cale in 2013. Uh, patients who had FSM immediately after C-section got out of the hospital about um, a third of a day uh, sooner than the other group. That means some, as an average, that means some got out a full day early, some got out a half a day early. As an average, they got uh, out of the hospital much more quickly than patients who did not have FSM after surgery. Uh, more importantly for the patient is that their activity, their pain with activity was half, 5.4 out of 10, with untreated patients down to a 2.7 out of 10, 
in the treated group when they were asked to, you know, when they make you walk around the, the floor, uh, the hospital floor after your surgery, and it's pretty uncomfortable. This says that you'll be able to do that with your pain level at a three. If you have diabetic wounds or if you have patients with diabetic wounds, this is a treatment with FSM. Um, this patient had six treatments in three weeks, um, twice a week for three weeks. There's a seven centimeter ulcer on the left side of his leg, and that healed in six treatments in three weeks. Um, the necrosis in the second digit, that was just about down to the bone, and that took about 12 treatments in six weeks, so twice a week for six weeks, and that recovered. Uh, this toe was not amputated, and the patient kept his foot, which was not what was expected. The third digit, that took seven treatments to resolve. It was healed skin to skin. Peripheral neuropathy, so this gentleman who had these nasty wounds on his feet, also had pain and numbness in his feet, and full sensation was restored, and pain was eliminated in eight treatments over four weeks. <clears throat> so uh, in wound healing and treating nerves, if you can increase ATP production and reduce inflammation, that is a huge advantage in treating diabetic wounds, neuropathies, and um, all sorts of injuries. Old problems in medicine, inflammation, degenerative diseases, and immune system activation. So virtually all degenerative diseases are inflammatory in nature. They have at their foundation inflammation, immune system activation, heart disease, irritable bowel, Crohn's, Alzheimer's, asthma, COPD, all of those illnesses. The problem with anti-inflammatory arthritis, problem with anti-inflammatory drugs is basically they take too long to work. They have too many side effects. They cause damage to the gut, the kidneys. They block prostaglandins for prolonged periods of time, and there are prostaglandins that do good things that you need. So when you block all of them, uh, that's what creates the side effects. And in point of fact, the medications that are used to change cytokines don't work very well. Cytokines are hard to change, and when they change, they change slowly. And they change so that they're below the normal range when you use drugs to do it. <coughs> and um, uh, that's a problem. So if you can't do it with medication, um, we can do it with frequency-specific microcurrent. So you have to ask, what would happen to this particular problem if you could reduce lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation by 62% in four minutes? So uh, lipoxygenase is one of the prostaglandins that creates inflammation. Cyclooxygenase is one of the prostaglandins that creates inflammation. So you've also heard of COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors, um, like Celebrex. So FSM, the frequency to reduce inflammation, reduced lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation by 62% in four minutes in every animal tested in a blinded mouse model. Now, the mice weren't blind, but the experimenters were blind as to what they were doing to the mice, so which mice were painted with arachidonic acid and which ones weren't, uh, which ones were treated with FSM and which ones weren't, uh, who had the placebo frequency and who had the active frequency, um, the people that were measuring the mice, painting the mice, treating the mice were all blinded as to what was going on. There was still a 62% reduction in lipoxygenase in four minutes, 30% reduction in COX mediated in four minutes. So that's kind of like Celebrex without the side effects, right? It's equivalent, this reduction in COX is equivalent to injectable Toradol, which is what they use on you after surgery by injection when you're in the hospital. All the animals responded, and it's a four-minute time-dependent response. So half of the effect is there in two minutes. The full effect is there in four minutes. And the interesting thing was that only one frequency combination reduced inflammation. So 40 and 116 reduce inflammation. 116 is the frequency for the immune system. Four minutes of uh, one-tenth of a hertz, just current unmodulated, kind of like what Alan used in the delayed onset muscles from the study in 1999, um, that produced no reduction in ear swelling. Uh, four minutes of our frequencies, 
for reducing mineral deposits in bone, gave no reduction in swelling. Four minutes of what we think of as the intermediate injury, so what you've run uh, to help injury healing, um, that gave no reduction in swelling. And four minutes of the frequency to reduce inflammation in the skin gave no reduction in ear swelling. The only frequency that worked was 40 hertz on channel A and 116 hertz on channel B, which is to reduce inflammation in the immune system. <coughs> if you sunburn a mouse, and at this point you might start feeling sorry for the mice, but that's, anyway, can't do anything about that. Um, when you sunburn a mouse, if you've ever had a sunburn, you know that your tissue gets red and inflamed and puffy, right? It's swollen. So this is the swelling in an untreated mouse who's been exposed to UV light at 21, 23, 25, and 27 hours. There was a group that had the microcurrent immediately after the UV exposure, and um, and then they were treated, then they were measured at 21, 23, 25, and 27 hours. And there was no statistical significance in the reduction in swelling. It actually, it went down a bit, but it wasn't very dramatic. Um, the group, that, there was another group that was treated at two hours, <clears throat> and then they were measured at two hours after UV exposure. Then they were measured at 21, 23, 25, and 27 hours. And um, they had a statistically significant reduction in swelling to statistical significance of 0 uh, 0.01, which is a very nice effect if you're a statistician um, or live in that world. That means there's pretty much one chance in, I think, 10,000 that, um, that it's a coincidence. Now, what's interesting is that when you sunburn a mouse, that suppresses immune system response. So one of the tests that they do is to paint a contact sensitizing agent on the mouse's hind leg at the time of the UV exposure. And then two weeks later, the same agent is painted on the ears. Well, the normal response is 30 units of swelling when the um, oxazolone is painted on the ears two weeks after <clears throat> the original exposure. So if you sunburn the mouse, and then you paint oxazolone on the ears two weeks later, sunburn suppress the immune system response um, by 63.4%, 63%. So IS stands for immune suppression. So the immune system is suppressed by 63% by the UV or sunburn exposure. A group that was treated at two hours that had the best reduction in swelling, the one that was um, statistically significant, had their immune suppression reduced from 63 to 57%, which is nice. This is good, right? To immune suppression reversal means that you're doing something to the immune system. What was interesting was the group that was sunburned and then treated immediately with microcurrent group that did not have a um, um, statistically significant reduction in swelling, had their immune system suppression reduced by half two weeks after a single four-minute application of one and only one frequency combination, 40 hertz on channel A and 116 hertz on channel B. So it had their immune system suppression reduced from 63 to 31%. Um, the numbers aren't as important as the fact that a single four-minute application of a one and only one frequency combination changed immune system function permanently. So that's the take-home message from this experiment. And <clears throat> what it suggests is the mechanism behind what FSM does in all degenerative conditions that are inflammatory in nature. So asthma, COPD, or emphysema, irritable bowel and inflammatory bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, pancreatitis, ulcerative colitis, liver disease of various sorts, rheumatoid arthritis, and degenerative arthritis are all 
associated with Lox and Cox inflammation. And FSM has tremendous positive responses in those conditions. So what would happen if you could reduce all of the inflammatory cytokines in 90 minutes? So cytokines are another group of peptides that are associated with inflammatory conditions. And the problem with medical treatment of cytokines is that um, the medications that they use, so the biological drugs like Humira and other ones whose name I can't remember, um, but Humira is kind of the, the parent drug of this class, um, take the cytokines down below the normal range. So the risk with these biological drugs is while they reduce the cytokines, so your inflammatory condition gets better, they also really reduce it below normal. So um, the patients have problems with uh, contracting um, cancer and various infections because your body uses cytokines to protect you from cancer and infections. So the trick is going to be in a perfect world to reduce all the cytokines and to have that reduction stop in the normal range. And that is exactly what frequency-specific microcurrent does in this group of fibromyalgia patients who have their fibromyalgia associated with spine trauma. So we ran the frequency to reduce inflammation in the spinal cord on 54 fibromyalgia patients with a history of trauma. So this is a very particular subset of fibromyalgia patients. They're an average of nine and a half, 10 years chronic. I presented a case report on 25 of them at NIH and got blood sample data on 13. We published six, but I have data on 13 patients from an immuno microimmunochemist at NIH by the name of Terry Phillips. The subset patients did not differ in age or chronicity. Uh, we had a control patient that just had myofascial pain from trigger points, and she turned out not to have body-wide inflammation. So the thing you need to know about fibromyalgia from spine trauma is 30% of fibromyalgia patients um, in the U.S., uh, so there are 6 million fibromyalgia patients. That means 30% of them are 2 million people have this particular kind of fibromyalgia. Um, and yes, there are different causes, but that's another lecture. Only one frequency combination is effective for this kind of fibromyalgia, and that is the frequency to reduce inflammation and reduce it in the spinal cord, which is 10 hertz. So we call these patients 40 and 10 because it's 40 hertz on channel A and 10 hertz on channel B to reduce inflammation in the spinal cord. As a group, they came in at an average with their pain at a 7.4, so like between a 5.5 and, and, and a 9, and it was reduced from a 7.4 to a 1.3 in 90 minutes. Um, the uh, <clears throat> patients recovered from fibromyalgia, but that was individualized. We had FSM in the office, some of them needed a home unit, some, almost all, had physical therapy to repair the discs in their neck and stabilize their spine. They still had to recondition. They still had to have supplements to repair their gut. We ended up treating the irritable bowel, the adrenals. Uh, some people had interstitial cystitis. That responds really well to FSM as well. This is the setup. Uh, towel around the neck, towel around the feet. Um, and this is what happened. Um, when we measured the cytokines in this, this is the bar graph on the right, is a patient who had fibromyalgia for, I think, probably four years. He was the very first one we did the blood sample on. Interleukin-1 went from 392, almost 393, down to 21 in um, 90 minutes. Uh, medically speaking, that is impossible. Cytokines are hard to change. When they change, they change slowly, and if you change them with drugs, they will drop below the normal range. And the normal range for um, cytokines are um, between 0 and 25 picograms per milliliter. So it stopped in the normal range, and it came down at a logarithmic rate in all five patients. Even the one who didn't have a good pain reduction still had her cytokines reduced. 10F-alpha. Um, 
went from 299 down to 20. And once again, that stopped in the normal range and it was reduced. If you take out the one who had cord compression that didn't respond well with pain reduction, they're all grouped pretty tightly. And with interleukin-6, it was even tighter. So there's not a lot of scatter. This is not random. This is very predictable. It's reproducible. Her interleukin-6 went from 204 to, down to 15. The p-value is two zeros and an eight. Um, and this is in 90 minutes, and it stops in the normal range. This is the important part, okay? Substance P is produced in the spinal cord, and it was 132. Normal is below 30. So it's 132, went down to 10. And the fact that substance P changed so dramatically uh, indicates that we were indeed treating the spinal cord because substance P is produced in the spinal cord and then measured out in the peripheral blood in this case. Endorphins went up by a factor of uh, more than 10 times and went from 5 to 88. And yes, this one is above what is considered a normal baseline. It went up to 88. By about the 30-minute mark, 40-minute mark, she was um, so well stunned is the only other really accurate way to describe it. Um, they get so floaty, it's like an induced euphoria um, that she really would prefer not to talk or open her eyes. By the time she got to noon, so an hour and 10 minutes into the treatment, she had her eyes closed and really preferred that I not bother her. So that was pretty fun. This group of patients gets pretty floaty, especially the first four or five sessions. After the first four or five, it's like the system accommodates to it, and even though the pain comes down, your um, endorphins still go up, um, but not quite. It doesn't have the same kind of floaty effect. Cortisol went up, but it wasn't a stress response because neuropeptide Y, which follows the sympathetic nervous system, went down. Cortisol went up as a side effect of increasing the endorphins. So if you're going to increase endorphins that much, you buy um, the same mechanism, increase HTH, uh, which is cort uh, cortisone uh, releasing factor. <clears throat> and that goes up and that raises cortisol. Pain went down from an average of 7.3 to a 1.3. And for those of you that, I'm, that appreciate statistics, this p-value has actually six zeros when you do the math. But when you publish papers, you only put in three zeros because as the statistician said, um, anything more than three zeros is just showing off. So, um, and he was British. He's just not into showing off that much. Um, the important thing with this paper is that all patients experience pain relief. 58% of them, 31 out of the 53, experienced complete resolution of fibromyalgia within four months. That is to say, they recovered. The most important thing you need to know about fibromyalgia is it's curable um, in most cases. Uh, improved tender point sensitivity, sleep quality improved without medication. One patient relapsed. Um, 13 out of the 53 discontinued treatment for reasons not related to treatment side effects. So um, some said it was the expense, some said it was the time. Um, my personal feeling is that it's possible that for people who had been in pain for an average of 12 years, when you take their pain from an average of a seven to a zero in 90 minutes, at the end of it, you have created an existential crisis is pretty much unparalleled in medicine. Who are you if you're not in pain? Um, so fibromyalgia over the years, there are about five or six different pretty clearly um, established types of fibromyalgia. And this, is, this accounts for about 30% of them. So this is the optimal patient, um, 18 years chronic. Um, to have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, you have to have 11 of 18 tender points, 10 to the less than four pounds per square inch pressure. She started out at 14 out of 18. In a month, she had 11 out of 18. In a month after that, she had a seven out of 18. Uh, range of motion improved. Her medication was almost eliminated for both sleep and pain and muscle relaxants, her digestion improved, IBS resolved, her energy level came back, 
and at six years she had still maintained her recovery. <clears throat> so an awful lot of patients use functional medicine as a modern approach for the old problems in medicine, include, including fibromyalgia and all sorts of chronic conditions. Um, and functional medicine, to my mind, is the way of the future, but in general, it takes too long and it costs too much if what you're using is supplements, diet, and lifestyle modification. It's, um, it's asking a lot and it takes too long and it's expensive. Patient compliance is poor because the results take a while. So functional medicine is a modern approach for old problems in medicine. And what happens when you combine frequency-specific microcurrent with functional medicine is the FSM works immediately to reduce pain and increase ATP production or energy. So the fatigue goes down, the pain goes down, um, and function improves when you reduce inflammation. But you need a functional medicine approach to create lasting and stable improvements. So working on somebody's irritable bowel, Crohn's, or ulcerative colitis is pretty easy with FSM, but they still need to eliminate gluten, sometimes eggs and milk, sometimes nightshades, sometimes um, uh, oxalates um, from their diet. Um, they need to sleep adequate amounts, um, reduce their stress levels. This creates lasting, stable improvements. They get off the table feeling better and out of pain, but in order for that to last, patients have to take a hand in their own recovery by modifying their diet and some of their lifestyle habits. Another old problem in medicine, nerve pain. Hard to treat, hard to endure if you're the patient. Muscle pain, myofascial trigger points, scar tissue between organs, between muscles, fascia, um, abdominal adhesions, and pelvic pain. And the problems with treating those is the treatment takes too long, it's not very effective, and it costs too much. Um, it's just, uh, there's a, a fair amount of side effects if you're going to be injecting around a nerve or trigger points. Dissolving scar tissue in the abdomen is virtually impossible unless you do surgery, and doing surgery has its own problems. So, outcomes in neuropathic pain. <clears throat> uh, we published 20 cases. I've probably, probably treated 500, but this is what I could find in the charts that were publishable. Um, average chronicity was about seven years. All patients experienced pain reduction. Um, so they came in with their average pain at a 6.8. So some came in at a 9 and some came in at a 5. So they're almost a 7 on the 0 to 10 scale. And the first session when they came in, and at the end of that session they were down to about a 2. Um, second treatment, they came in with their pain about a 5, 4.8. And at the end of the second session, uh, they were down to about a 1. And so what you can see from that is even though their pain went up from where it was when they left, it did not ever get back to as bad as it was when they came in the first time. 65% um, of these 20 patients fully recovered in about five treatments, 4.6 treatments, um, 13 out of the 20 patients. Um, no adverse reactions aside from the fact that they get pretty stoned. Um, this endorphin response is universal, especially when you're treating nerve pain, um, spinal cord and nerves. <clears throat> Here's similar situation as in the fibromyalgia group. 25% terminated care prior to cut recovery for reasons not related to treatment side effects. Treatment was um, either took too long or they couldn't afford it. Uh, but once again, I have to wonder what what happens to you when your pain has been uh, around a seven for seven years and somebody gets rid of it in 60 minutes? Who are you if you're not in pain? So I think that's uh, a consideration when we look at the uh, patients who stay with treatment and the patients who do not um, and, and why that is. Myofascial trigger points and knocks in the muscles that are, are painful and that refer pain to distal areas. 
Um, back in 1998, we published 50 cases of myofascial pain in the head, neck, and face. Um, and that was honestly before we knew what we were doing and our outcomes would have been better um, had I known what I was known then, what I know now. Average of five years chronic, a range from one to 28 years. The patients served as their own controls because 88% of them had failed with other treatments. <clears throat> we figured if they were going to have a placebo response, they'd have it with one of the six other people that treated them. And they recovered in 11 visits in eight weeks. Um, the starting pain was a 6.8 on a 0 to 10 scale. Ending was a 1.5. Um, and to tell you the truth, it took 11 treatments in eight weeks because I didn't know what I was doing. That's the fact of it. Most cervical myofascial pain is caused by injuries to the discs, the ligaments, and the facet joints in the cervical spine. And I didn't know that in 1998. Um, they got better anyway. Uh, they recover much more quickly these days than they did back then. In the lumbar cases, which were published in 2004, um, it was eight years average chronicity. The range was one, two months, up to 20 years. 87% had failed with other treatments. The patient pretty much served as their own control because of this, because if they were going to have a placebo response, it is assumed that they would have had that response with one of the five other people that they treated with before they got to FSM. Now, this is more representative of what you get in myofascial pain in the lumbar spine uh, and the C-spine now. Six visits in six weeks. Twice a week for four to six weeks is the prescription. Twice the first week, twice the second week, once a week for the next two or three weeks, and usually done. 6.8 on the 0 to 10 scale uh, was the incoming pain. Ending pain scale was 1.5. Usually, if you can get pain down below a 2, um, you kind of sort of don't notice it. You can do your daily activities and not mind it. <coughs> we did a, a scar tissue um, project uh, dissolving scar tissue in mature burns at the burn unit in Mercy St. John's uh, in Springfield, Missouri. This is a burn center project. Roger Huckfeld, uh, Bart Flick arranged it, and Dr. Huckfeld was the chair of that department. This was done in 2003. We have about five or six frequencies for scar tissue, uh, three or four that were used predominantly in these, in these cases, and uh, that's one of our patients. Um, every patient had statistically significant permanent increases in range of motion after three one-hour treatments, and these burn scars are pretty much the worst of the worst. Um, uh, yeah, it was pretty extraordinary. Um, did abdominal adhesion research at Baylor Medical School with David Weisman. Um, he has a rat model where he induces um, abdominal adhesions one week by abrading the colon and, um, uh, and putting a stitch in it, and stitching it to the abdominal wall. And at the end of a week, they have a very well-defined, mature, almost cartilaginous, dense scar tissue holding the cecum to the abdominal wall. Um, we, tr he, we got permission and opened up three rats. That's him doing surgery on the rat um, to open it up. And then we used microcurrent uh, with the probes on either side of the rat's abdomen. And he tied three or four frequencies. And then when I got to the frequency, 13 hertz on channel A and 77 hertz connective tissue on channel B, the adhesion literally liquefied. It turned from white and hard and almost cartilaginous to snot, basically, liquid, clear, stringy, slimy. Um, and we duplicated that response clinically the next day, treating eight patients with chronic abdominal pain and pelvic adhesions or abdominal adhesions and pelvic pain. <clears throat> so um, we don't have a study in humans published yet, but we're working on it in this area. So if you are a manual therapist, um, this she's working on uh, an Olympic swimmer, and he had adhesions and myofascial pain from adhesions between his ureter and his psoas and his QLs. And you, when you combine FSM 
with manual therapy, especially when you're working on scar tissue, it is a perfect combination. So those of you that are manual therapists um, and want to enhance your manual therapy skills, that is um, it's a perfect combination. The frequencies uh, take your skills and knowledge and make them 100 times more effective. I would have said 10 times, but 100 is closely more accurate. So frequency-specific microcurrent is the new tool. So the frequencies were developed in the 19, early 1900s, 1908 to about 1935. We resurrected that list in 1995. I started using it in 96, uh, started teaching it in 97, and um, can't say how the frequencies were derived. And mechanism of action we'll talk about a little bit. The 1920s equipment was not microcurrent. It was DC current when wall current was direct current. And the frequency response is very frequency specific. The frequency effect matches the description. So the frequency to reduce inflammation reduces pain, reduces inflammation, 62% um, in mice, um, 10 times in fibromyalgia patients, reduces inflammation, swelling, redness, pain, doesn't do anything for range of motion, doesn't do anything for anything else, it just reduces inflammation. The frequency to reduce or eliminate, dissolve, fibrosis is scarring, dissolves scar tissue, increases range of motion, doesn't do anything for pain, unless the scarring is causing the pain, doesn't do anything for inflammation. Frequency to stop hemorrhage stops bleeding and pain in the menses and prevents bruising and new injuries. So when you use it postoperatively on a patient, you um, uh, can prevent bruising. So if somebody has their hip, hip joint replaced that is normally black and blue, just black from the hip to the toe, and our patients treated postoperatively do not bruise after hip replacement at all. Mineral ion deposits. Minerals softens tissue, reduces pain, does a pretty good job with treating kidney stones, uh, making them smaller. Some changes in motion, but it's not good for anything else. Doesn't do anything for inflammation, doesn't do anything for scarring. There's a frequency for shingles and oral and genital herpes that eliminates the pain. It doesn't just reduce it, it's gone. And it eliminates the lesions uh, within 24 to 48 hours of the time you use it. It has to be used for two, sometimes four hours these days. The virus seems to have mutated in the last 10 years or so. Um, but it's pretty magic if you've ever had shingles. It reduces the course of the illness from six weeks to about two days, which is a very good thing. Frequency for kidney stone pain. 20 hertz on channel A, 60 hertz on channel B. It's effective in every case so far, and we're into triple digits at this point with two, 300 patients. And uh, it's not useful for anything else. <clears throat> so we have a published case report in singles. Um, this was published in Practical Pain Management in 2010. He was an 85-year-old man with um, singles in the ophthalmic branch of five. Um, took four hours of treatment. Uh, he was pain-free at the end of the first hour had no return of pain, we treated it for four hours because singles in the ophthalmic pants of five and an 85-year-old man does not get better. It universally becomes um, post hepatic neuralgia in that age group, and it is often the proximal cause or related to um, uh, their ill health and ultimate demise. No return of pain, and the lesions were gone in 48 hours, and this is representative of what we're able to do in acute onset shingles. So you have to wonder, if you haven't wondered already, how do frequencies change conditions in specific tissues? Well, the fact of the matter is that the human body is a quantum biological system. So we're used to um, uh, Newtonian physics, where as a large object, you follow Newtonian physics. You have mass, you have weight. If you draw it from a building, you're going to accelerate at 32 feet per second per second. Um, but as a biological system, your living tissue is made up of biochemicals. Well, the thing with biochemicals is that they are quantum in nature. 
molecules, atoms, subatomic particles are too small for Newtonian physics to work really well. Um, and that's where you get into the quantum aspects of biology. Um, these molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles are held together by electromagnetic bonds. And the trick with electromagnetic or mechanical or chemical bonds is that every bond has a frequency at which it resonates, a frequency that it operates like a, a electromagnetic lock to hold it together with its neighbor. That's a resonant frequency that creates the bond that holds the molecules, atoms, and subatomic particles together. <clears throat> Short version, there's a lot of biophysics involved in this, but if you read um, Energy Medicine, the Scientific Basis, especially the second edition, you'll find that your body is an electromagnetic system that looks solid, but the cells function as a semiconductor network. There are water molecules that line this matrix inside and around your cells, and those water molecules vibrate and flicker and in the outer shell of the water molecules, there's a little hole for an electron that makes your body pretty much like a computer chip. Silicon and germanium have a hole for an electron in a particular specific um, place in the matrix. And that is what is created with um, water molecules that line your cell membranes. And those semiconductor network that semiconductor network conveys current, charge, and vibrational information. Okay? So in your body, on every cell, you have a membrane receptor that's like a, sort of like a little antenna. It doesn't actually look like this. It looks like a little disc sort of embedded in the cell membrane. And this membrane protein receptor is connected to your genes inside your cells and those receptors determine what your cell does, how it does it, and when it does it. So they just determine cell function. The receptors reconfigure in response to stimuli. So if you have a bacterial infection, you have a little bitty fragment of a bacterial membrane that lands on this receptor, and the receptor recognizes that this is a bacterial fragment changes kinases, which are uh, little chemicals and little strings sort of inside the cell, little peptides. Those change transcription factors. That alters genetic expression. And the cell goes from uh, one type of function to producing pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it's because the cytokines are used to control infection the little receptor gets the message, hey, there's a bacteria here, there's an infection here, and the cell's response is to produce cytokines. The important thing is receptor changes alter cell signaling in the kinases and cell function with transcription factors, DNA changes, and RNA, messenger RNA. So that's how these receptors work. Now, we're used to drugs. Um, anti-inflammatory drugs or um, any of the medications that we take that, or even the supplements that you take, those medications and supplements act like a key in a lock in the receptor to change the cell genetics and cell function <clears throat> by landing on this receptor and changing the way the cell works internally. The drug is not taken into the cell. The drug lands on the receptor, changes how the cell functions by changing its genetic expression. Key in a lock. The frequencies act like your key fob, your magnetic <coughs> key beeper that opens the same lock with an electromagnetic signal. Um, it changes membrane protein configuration and cell function electromagnetically. So it acts as if it dissolves scar tissue crosslinks. It acts as if it disassembles the virus capsid in singles. There's nothing else that explains the speed with which this happens. 
and it acts as if it changes cells signaling to reduce inflammation because the inflammatory products all stop in the normal range. That's the important part. If you're changing this receptor and normalizing it, returning it to normal, you're going to normalize cell function and that ultimately affects cell structure depending on um, uh, how, um, how, what, what cell is being affected and what you're doing to it. So that's what FSM can do for you. How do you learn how to use it? Uh, frequency specific microcurrent and pain management is the textbook on the pain applications. Um, and uh, that was published in 2010 by Elsevier. The technology has, and our knowledge of how to use the frequency has improved a bit since the textbook came out. And uh, the resonance effect is the new book, and it has a lot of the visceral applications. So asthma, irritable bowel, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, the other types of fibromyalgia um, protocols for those uh, conditions are found in the resonance effect, plus a very uh, entertaining story about how FSN came to be and uh, how you can use it. Um, the best way to learn FSM when, uh, when you have the chance is a four-day seminar. Uh, it used to be two days, then it went to three days, and now it's four days. Um, we just can't, uh, there's too much in the core seminar because I don't know what to send you home without. So it's, um, it's a new tool that solves many old problems in medicine for both patients and practitioners. In four days, there are eight hours or nine hours of practicum instructions to actually get your hands on patients and treat patients. Um, there are seminars in Jacksonville next week, Chicago in October. I'll be in Nuremberg in December, Cleveland in January. Uh, Cleveland Clinic, it looks as if we're going to, we may get Category 1 continuing medication, uh, medical education credit, CME credit. Um, Cleveland Clinic sponsors that class. Phoenix, Arizona will be um, February 23rd to the 26th, and Portland will be in April. I'll be in England in September of next year, and we'll be in Taiwan in April. So, um, Patients, if you are listening to this webinar, send your practitioner, MDs, chiropractors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, acupuncturists, some PhDs, um, all medical um, providers, and in some states even massage therapists can use FSM. Go to www.frequencyspecific.com and look for the discount coupon. Is there a discount coupon? Yeah, there's uh, core, $200 off. Oh, core 200. Mm -hmm. Yep, if you listen to this webinar and you decide to sign up for the seminar, um, look for the discount coupon that says core 200 and it'll give you $200 off the course. Fair warning though, frequency specific microcurrent will change your life, your practice, and your outcomes forever. And once you've, once you've done FSM and found out what's possible, you don't ever get to go back, but that's an okay thing. You'll enjoy it. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the resonance effect, and I hope you um, give frequency-specific microcurrent a try.